Hey, 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 welcome back everyone to Strange Mind 6. I'm your host Ruby, and we're gonna get back into the Book of the Bazaar Freaky Facts and Strange Stories by Varla Ventura. The Frankie Silver Story Frankie Silver was the first woman to be hung in the state of North Carolina. She killed her husband, Charlie Silver, on December 22, 1831. Frankie, born Frances Stewart, had been a young girl of about 17 years old when she married Charlie Silver, who was probably all of 18. It was a hard life that they lived, and within a year, Frankie had given birth to a baby girl. Her life was miserable. The Silvers lived in an isolated area miles from the nearest town, and Charlie had a habit of leaving his young wife alone for days at a time while he was off drinking and chasing women. To add to Frankie's misery, when Charlie came back home drunk, he was abusive. Everyone knew that Charlie beat Frankie. They may not have approved, but wife beating was an accepted practice in those days. There was the unwritten but accepted law that was called Rule of Thumb, which said that a man shouldn't beat his wife with a stick that was wider than his thumb. Charlie, it was said, broke that rule. On December 23rd, 1831, Frankie came to the house where Charlie's family lived to tell them that Charlie hadn't been home for days. Their cabin was cold. She'd burned up all the firewood and she was taking the baby and going home to her folks. She didn't care if Charlie never came home again. Charlie's family searched the woods and river for him, thinking maybe he'd fallen through the ice or been attacked by an animal. Finally, Charlie's father hiked 40 miles across the mountains of Tennessee where there lived a slave who folks said could conjure. The slave was gone, but his master used the conjure bell. I'm sorry, conjure ball. A ball on a string that moved like a pendulum over a map that Charlie's father had drawn. It stopped right over the crude stretch of Charlie's cabin. That's where to look for Charlie, said the man. Meanwhile, a neighbor, Jack Collis, explored the abandoned cabin. He noticed that there was an extraordinary amount of ash in the fireplace. Frankie's last fire seemed to have consumed a whole amount of wood and burned very hot and very long. The ashes were suspiciously greasy. Poking around in the fireplace, Collis discovered bits of human bone. Neighbors pried up the floorboards, and found a puddle of blood, large as hog's liver. Next, the family and friends searched around outside the house and found grisly parts of Charlie, parts that wouldn't burn, hidden all over. In a recently dug hole filled with ashes was the iron heel of of one of his hunting shoes, a hollow tree stump concealed his liver and heart. Charlie's family buried the body parts as quickly as they found them. When they found more parts, instead of opening the grave, 
They dug a new grave. As a result, Charlie Silver has three graves. On January 10th, 1832, Frankie was arrested for the murder of her husband. But there was a problem. Frankie stood four feet ten inches high. And Charlie was big, weighing twice as much as she. How could she have dragged his body to the fireplace and chopped it up herself. She had to have help. Her mother and her brother were arrested, only to, play, only to be released for lack of evidence. Frankie was brought to trial alone, and within two days she was found guilty and sentenced to be hanged. The prosecution and the legend accused her of hacking up Charlie and burning his pieces out of jealousy for his affairs with other women. Frankie never got to tell her side of the story because she was not allowed to testify. Of course, because back in those days, they didn't allow women to actually testify or speak like we're able to now. Lizzie Borden's 40 Wax. In August 1892, spinster Lizzie Borden was 32 years old, and her sister Emma was 40. The Borden family, including the girl's father Andrew and their stepmother Abby, lived in a dark, cramped wooden house in a shabby neighborhood in Fall Revere, Massachusetts. The only running water came from the kitchen sink and the only toilet was located in the cellar. They didn't even own a horse and buggy. Andrew Borden was ironically a retired undertaker and very rich, but he also was a mazeer. He had married plain, heavy-set Abby because he needed a wife, an unpaid housekeeper. Emma and Lizzie refused to call her mother. Lizzie experienced some severe trauma in her childhood. For example, she loved animals and kept a coop of pigeons in the family's barn. When small boys started to break into the barn, presumably to get the pigeons, Andrew Borden's solution was to kill the birds. Lizzie later recalled asking her father where were the heads of the pigeons. Perhaps her father, perhaps her father's cruelty to her pigeons fueled Lizzie's own inherent cruelty or perhaps the trauma of the pigeon experience merely hardened Lizzie's heart. For not long after, Lizzie chopped off the head of her stepmother's cat. The cat had pushed open the door to Lizzie's bedroom, where Lizzie had been entertaining guests. Lizzie carried the cat downstairs, put its little head on the chopping block, and, well, you guys know the rest. For days, Abby wondered where her cat had gone. Finally, Lizzie told her, You go downstairs and you'll find your cat. On the morning of August 4th, 1892, while Andrew was out checking on one of his businesses and Emma was away visiting friends, Lizzie told the Borden's maid, Bridget, that her stepmother had gone off to see a sick friend. Later in the morning, Andrew returned home, carrying a small parcel wrapped in paper. It contained a broken locket that he had picked off the floor of one of his properties. Bridget opened the door for him, and as she stood at the entrance, letting him in, she heard a sound that was very unusual in the Borden house. Lizzie Borden 
was standing at the top of the stairs laughing out loud like a solicitous daughter lizzie helped her father relax on the dark horsehair sofa so that he could nap she pulled off his shoes and folded his coat under his head for a pillow she then told bridget about a sale of goods at a local shop perhaps to get her out of the house bridget said she'd go later and climbed the stairs to her little attic room to lie down for a while she was rused shortly after 11 a.m by lizzie's shout come down father's dead bridget and lizzie quickly called for doctors and friends galore and by 11.45, there was a crowd gathered outside the house. The doctor, after examining Andrew Borden's gory remains, asked for a sheet to cover the body. Lizzie answered, better get two. And where was Mrs. Borden? First, Lizzie repeated the story that her stepmother had gone to see a sick friend. Then she added that she might have heard Abby come in and that maybe she was upstairs. Bridget and another woman climbed the stairs to find Abby with her head crushed in, lying in a pool of congealed blood on the floor of the upstairs guest room. During the funeral, the police searched Lizzie's closet for a blood-stained dress, but to no avail. The following week, she was arrested for murder of her father and her stepmother. Although there was great evidence that could prove Lizzie was the murderer, she was acquitted. The jury saw her as too much of a lady to have committed such a gruesome crime. After the trial, Lizzie and Emma, now rich, bought themselves a 14-room mansion in a neighborhood called The Hill where the rest of the gentry lived. Though it was never proved, the rest of the gentry living up on Hill had to wonder, did Lizzie Borden kill her father by hitting him with an axe ten times? And her stepmother, nineteen? And could she have hit them hard enough to crush Abby Borden's skull? Slice Andrew's eye in half and render his face into an unrecognizable pulp they never bothered to find out they didn't care to socialize with Lizzie Borden not one bit in the words of Florence King lacking ladylike poison Lizzie Borden did whatever, what every over-civilized, understated wasp and entirely capable of doing once we finally admit we're mad as hell and aren't going to take it anymore. She went from Anglo to Saxon in a thrice. Hmm. And if you guys actually um, want to know more or see some investigations on the Lizzie Borden house, I suggest um, going to Seth Borden's page. Um, he's a really, really good YouTuber. Um, yeah, and he's actually found out that he's related to Lizzie Borden. So he actually wanted to do some investigating. But definitely, I do recommend his page. But continuing the stories, we're going to go to the next one. And that is one more reason to fear clowns. Oh, goodness. And I don't like clowns. <laughs> John Wayne Gacy was an overweight, unattractive man with a passion 
for doing bad things and killing young males. Like so many other serial killers, Gacy had delusions or at least dreams of grandeur. He wanted to be a local icon, so he joined local pol political groups, threw parties, and dressed as a clown named Pogo to entertain the local kids. His efforts were well received and he was popular with children and parents alike until authorities found the bodies of scores of neighborhood boys buried in his basement. In 1980, a jury convicted Mr. Gacy of murdering 33 young men and he was executed 14 years later. Words by Agatha Christie Every murderer is probably somebody's old friend. The next story is No Willy Wonka Jeffrey Dahmer was known to be a calm, articulate man working in a chocolate factory in Milwaukee. In reality, he was a murdering, cannibalistic sociopath. In 1989, he was arrested for molesting children. And in 1991, he was arrested for the murder of 13 men and sentenced to 957 years in prison. A Murdering Madame Patty Cannon was a large woman, said to be equal to a man when it came down to a fight. In the early 1800s, she was known for kidnapping free black people and selling them as slaves. <clears throat> Excuse me. When Cannon was in her 60s, one of her tenants discovered a grave by accident when his plow horse sank into a hollow. He unearthed a blue chest, which he opened to find not a secret stash of cash, but the corpse of a slave trader Cannon had killed years before, for a large sum he had been carrying. The tenant went to the authorities, who, after many years of turning a blind eye to Cannon's depraved dealings, were forced to arrest her. The investigation of Cannon's property led to the discovery of several other bodies, some of which were children. Cannon's victims never received justice rather than stand trial. Cannon poisoned herself in 1829 while in prison. Mm -mm. She needed to rot in prison. <sighs> the next well, we're actually going to skip that one. And we're going to read Florida's Female Serial Killer. Aileen Warnos. Apologize if I'm saying that wrong. Had a textbook serial killer childhood. Her father died in prison and her 15 year old mother abandoned her to her grandparents when she was an infant. Warnos had a baby herself at the age of 14 when her grandmother passed away and her hard drinking grandfather started to beat her and her brother. She left home taking to the road and supporting herself as a prostitute. Warnos collected arrest for crimes such as driving drunk, assault, and passing bad checks, and she was known under a variety of different aliases. Her rough and tumble life was briefly brightened up when she met Tyra Moore, a hotel maid at a gay bar in Daytona, Florida. The couple moved in together and Warnos supported them by turning tricks 
things started to fall apart in the late 1980s when Moore's alcohol addiction got the best of her and Warnos met Richard Malor, a trash-talking ex-con man who picked her up off of the highway. According to Warnos, she was sitting in Mallory's car, listening to him rant about women and rape and killing, and she snapped, pulling out the twenty two caliber she had in her purse and shot him three times. His body was found decomposing days later off the side of the highway. After the incident, the bodies of several more men began cropping up around the same area. Meanwhile, Warnos started bringing home extravagant trinkets and more pretended not to wonder why her partner could suddenly pay the rent again. The jig was finally up in June of 1990 when Warnos and Moore were found driving the car of a man who went missing days earlier. Florida police chased the women for several days and finally apprehended Warnos in a bar. She was convicted of six accounts of murder and sentenced to die when she did by lethal injection in 2002. And that, my dear friends, is going to end our storytelling. Tune in next time where we'll be reading more and we'll be reading some short stories called Dr. Death, Black Widows, and others. And if you can, I would greatly appreciate it if you hit that like button and hit that subscribe. It would mean a lot to me. And until then, my dear friends, this is Ruby signing off.